Hello everyone, minasan, konnichiwa. Welcome to our 12th episode of JSID Insta Live. My name is Jessica, and today I'm bringing on our next wonderful guest, Mr. Philip Mitchell. Now, Philip is the president of the Australia Japan Society of New South Wales, or AJS New South Wales for short. In today's episode, Philip is going to be telling us more about AJS New South Wales and some of the amazing events that they run throughout the year, as well as a little bit more about himself, such as his top travel recommendations in Japan or, for all you language learners out there, how he learnt Japanese. Just a reminder, if you've missed any of our previous episodes or you would like to watch any of them again, you can always go to our IGTV tag on Instagram or you can head to our website and go to information and culture, click on JC Insta Live, scroll down, and you'll find the archives there. Now, let's say hi to Philip, who is about to join us. Hi, Philip. Hi, Jess. How are you going? Yeah, I'm going great. How about yourself? Yes, uh, very well too, and uh, great to be able to speak to you today. Yes, likewise. So, are you ready to begin? Ready to begin. All right. So first of all, can you tell us a little bit more about what AJS New South Wales does? Sure. The Australia Japan Society of New South Wales was first incorporated in 1968. So we have a history of a bit over 50 years. We're the main grassroots leadership organisation for Australia Japan relations in New South Wales. And uh, we have as uh, our patrons traditionally for, for many years the Premier of New South Wales and the Consul General uh, of Japan. Our aims, to summarise, our aims are really to promote Australia-Japan relations, focusing on, on three particular areas, which is culture, uh, business and education. One other thing to mention, we're, we're part of an Australia-wide uh, body federation called the National Federation of Australia Japan Societies, of which I also happen to be president. This consists of um, similar societies, every, every state, every territory in Australia. The Governor General and the Minister for Foreign Affairs are co-patrons of the National Federation. Our National Federation also has a counterpart in Japan, the umbrella body for uh, all Japan Australia societies in each uh, city and each region of Japan. So that's pretty much a summary of who we are at AJS. It's amazing to know that AJS New South Wales has been operating for so long here in Sydney. Yeah, uh, longer than me. It's all, you know, I, I haven't been in Sydney that long myself. So you mentioned that you operate in three key areas. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what kind of events and things that you do throughout the year? So the events, as you might expect, do focus on this three key areas of uh, culture, business and education. I'll, I'll just give you a few examples <clears throat> of the type of events that, that we've um, recently held. First of all, there's our University Awards Night, where 2021 was uh, held in, in May. We uh, award or, or sponsor an award to each university within the Sydney region. There are six universities that teach Japanese studies. We provide an award to an outstanding student from each of those six universities. And what we do is we get all of the recipients together for one time for one event or function. Uh, also, their professors, so a, a representative of the faculty of each uh, university. Uh, first of all, they're presented uh, with their award by the Consul General. And uh, then we ask them to uh, tell us just briefly um, how they came to study Japanese, but also what are their future plans. It's a very popular event. It's very inspiring because it tells us a lot about um, where the future lies and it connects us with what uh, is the next generation. A, a business function, an example that we held in, uh, in April, I believe, was um, the newly appointed CEO of the Japanese technology company Fujitsu. We invited him to speak on the topic of uh, Fujitsu's uh, history in Australia which is also uh, just coming up to 50 years, and also uh, forward-looking what is uh, Fujitsu's uh, trend for the future and what are, the, what are the key plans and strategies for the future, apart from being very informative for us uh, in a business sense and something 
uh, people can't get to here that, that easily, it's a great networking opportunity for, for business. Last but not least, um, and uh, we held one quite recently, uh, we have a, an event called Shabera Night. Now, Shabera Naito is also very popular. We have several of these uh, each year, usually. This is, in simple terms, a Japanese-speaking evening. It's usually over dinner in a Japanese restaurant, and we usually hold it in collaboration with um, one or more of our allied organisations, in this case, um, the well-known organisation JetAA, which you'll be familiar with yourself. And you might ask a bit more, what is Shabera Naito? Well, it's a play on words, really, uh, because um, in Japanese, chabera naito means uh, you, you must speak or we must speak. Also in Japanese, uh, there is a kind of double meaning that uh, naito is an evening. So chabera naito is a speaking evening. We cater to different levels of language uh, ability for, for people, but we find it's a really good evening where people can practice their Japanese and enjoy a social setting and uh, generally, as I say, extremely popular. You can see that we cater to quite a wide range of uh, people and interests, and that's part of what uh, AJS is all about. So yes. what would you like me to tell you next? I understand that AJS New South Wales has a membership involved a yearly membership so how does that work and who who's allowed to join we're open to uh, members of all walks of life there's there's nobody prohibited from joining we, we are open to all ages we're open to australians and japanese all creeds and colors we're not a political organization we're open to anybody who's interested in japan that's who we'd like to have in our membership we have a number of different categories of membership we have individual membership, uh, corporate, uh, companies can become a member. Uh, a number of staff within the company are automatically registered in the system to receive our mailings and that kind of thing. Uh, we also have a family membership. So if you, it's a whole family, you can get a bit of a discount on the, the individual membership. And we have educational institutions. So this is how much will it cost you for a year if you're an individual? Normally it costs you $40 a year. Um, if you're a concession holder, then it uh, comes cheaper than that as well. Yeah, excellent. So that's actually quite affordable. Um, what does the membership get you? Mainly for most people, that involves uh, receiving our mailings, our, our information. We have an occasional newsletter, but um, also we have uh, events that I've mentioned. Typically 10 or more of those a year. Our members receive a discount on the participation cost in, in those events. From time to time, there are other little offers, you know, some, some, uh, someone might have a, uh, uh, a discounted uh, service or something that might be available. Um, and then there's also just the network that, that you have access to, over 1,300 people on our list. So that's uh, 1,300 people that are interested in Australian Japan relations uh, here in New South Wales. Excellent. So that's quite extensive. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that very good overview of AJS New South Wales. The next topic, would you be happy to talk a little bit about yourself and your own personal background? I'm happy to talk about myself. I don't know whether people are happy to listen, but I'll give it a go. You're obviously quite interested in the Japan-Australia relationship. What first sparked that? How did that come about for you? Well, at school, I studied... Uh, number of languages, but Japanese was not one of them. Uh, I managed to do well at, at languages and found I was interested in languages. And uh, the day that I left school, I knew only a very few words of Japanese. I knew Honda, Yamaha, Mitsubishi, Toyota, and that was about it, really. Maybe judo, something like that, karate, but not much else. So uh, uh, at that time, and told by looking at me that it was quite a long time ago that I finished school. Uh, at that time, Japan wasn't quite the flavour of the month in Australia that it later became, but there was a recognition that Japan um, was uh, uh, very important to our economic future uh, as a nation. Uh, what, what I did was I, I happened to notice there was an advertisement in, in uh, the press for a new type of language course a one-year intensive course in Japanese. So, so I investigated that and ended up putting in an application for uh, the 
Australian Japan Foundation to uh, provide a scholarship to, to do this for. Happily, and uh, I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity, I received that opportunity and I was able to do that course. That was um, uh, 10 months at uh, ANU in Canberra, the Australian National University, and the last months, everything, teachers and instru uh, instructors and students, uh, transferred to Japan for the last two months. That was what I did for 12 months, uh, eight hours a day, five days a week, 12 months, starting, we had a holiday for the 1st of January, which is New Year's Day, but we started on the 2nd of January. And we continued right up until just before Christmas. And uh, that was how I got involved with Japanese and with Japan. The truth of it is that I've been building on that foundation uh, for more than 40 years ever since. I find uh, we're always learning more. There's, there's no um, stop to our learning, no, no bar to us continuing learning. And it's certainly the case with uh, a second or third language. Uh, you're always learning and we always should be learning. That's what I'm doing. I'm always building on that original foundation. We also find, and I think a lot of us involved with Japan have this experience, that Japan grows on you. You get a bit involved and then you get more involved and uh, you really enjoy that and uh, the Japanese are very welcoming people and you get more involved still. And so it goes. That's what's happened with me over my uh, adult life. Yes, I think I can agree with that as well. Japan definitely grows on you the more you interact with the country and its people. Yes, indeed. For all of our Japanese language learners out there, do you have any good tips for them? I don't know if they're good tips, but uh, this is just from my personal experience. Um, I guess my first tip would be start as early as you can. Uh, I was fortunate I finished school at 16, and so I began studying Japanese at the age of 16. Um, if you can start earlier than that, that's better. Because the older we get, the harder it is to teach us new tricks. So I think start early, but the other side of that coin is um, it's never too late. Second tip would be, I think, to do with motivation. Uh, motivation is very important in uh, learning in general and language learning in particular. We have to have, if, if, if you want to study Japanese, you need to think about the motivation of that. Why do you want to study Japanese? And very soon also, what do you enjoy about studying Japanese? You're not going to be able to stick at it much if you're not enjoying it. I mean, yes, it's hard work. Um, there's probably going to be some rote learning involved. It's going to be hard work. But unless that's enjoyable hard work and unless you're motivated to do it, you can't make progress. But the other side of that is if you're doing something that you do enjoy and you are are reminded of the reason for doing that and uh, what you're learning is responding to those reasons, you're going to make progress and progress will build itself. So I think that's the second tip or point would be motivation. Third, and I'll, I'll make it the last of, of my tips, is uh, to spend as much time as you can with native speakers. This is um, perhaps obvious, but uh, it's very important. Language exists in its context. So uh, if we want to really learn Japanese, we need to do that with native speakers of Japanese. Uh, we need to learn from and with native speakers. We need to understand how language works in its, in its context. Ideally, that's probably going to involve spending some time in Japan. Not necessarily, but uh, that's probably a recommendation. If you can go to Japan, uh, that will definitely help with uh, your, your language uh, progress. Those are, are my tips for the day. I think they're very good tips for anyone who, are, um, who is learning Japanese. Well, I'm sure that you've had the opportunity to be able to go to Japan many times. I've had that privilege many times. In fact, uh, there's some people that keep count and they're up to 12 or 48 or 110. I'm afraid I've lost count, but I've been to Japan many times. And I can say without a shadow of doubt, I've enjoyed it every time and I've had some new and valuable uh, experience every time. That's exactly what Japan is all about. But could I get you to maybe narrow that down to your top three recommendations? Well, well I think that's that's quite a hard task for me because um, Japan is, is without doubt one of the best places in the world to visit. And one of the reasons for that is that Japan has to offer. It does have genuinely something for everyone. There's food culture, there's history, 
there's language, natural beauty, technology, and uh, I could go on. So there's something for everyone, and I think it's a first choice, what is, what is the best thing for you in terms of what to do, where to visit, and it's just important to do a bit of thinking and research on that. I'm going to give you, well, at least one uh, suggestion. It's, it's one that's become a little more popular with Australians in recent years, but was um, a well-kept secret for many years before that, and that is the northern island of Japan, Hokkaido. Why it's good to visit, it has many facets. In the wintertime, it has probably the world's best uh, dry powder snow ski. That's just in the wintertime, but in the opposite season, in the summertime, it's a kind of more temperate climate than uh, the more humid parts to the, the south and west, much more uh, probably pleasant for us Australians to uh, enjoy some tourism, maybe some uh, viewing of places of natural beauty, of which Hokkaido has many. And then apart from that, there's, I guess, a kind of human element to it as well. The food, I think, is second to none. There's uh, so much to try, um, so much to taste, so much to enjoy, and uh, presented so so beautifully. But also, I think it's uh, people. And uh, of course, uh, every region of Japan has its own pride in, in uh, many things. And the people of Hokkaido are very, very welcoming. Everyone in Japan tends to be welcoming to us as outsiders. But particularly, I found that in Hokkaido. Then also, just a little bit of a language tip, part of Japan is its regional variations. And once you get outside Tokyo, the regional dialects are you know, considerably varied, um, something that we don't really experience much of in Australia, but it's a great characteristic of Japan. Every area has its own dialects, and some of those are almost unintelligible, at least to a, you know, a beginner or intermediate student. But what I can say about Hokkaido is you'll be able to understand the people there because they speak very standard Japanese, similar to what you learn in the classroom, similar to what you uh, hear on TV or on the radio in Tokyo. I think I'd probably just leave it at that one tip because I, otherwise I'll go on too long and we'll, so we'll run out of time. Thank you so much for sharing your at least one of your top travel recommendations uh, for Japan. I've also had the pleasure to go to Hokkaido myself and absolutely loved it. Um, Where did you I, go in Hokkaido? I went to Sapporo uh, to see right. the, Yuki, um, the Sapporo Yuki Matsuri, the snow right. festival there, uh, which was quite impressive. Yes, definitely worth a visit. To take up briefly on that topic, every part of Japan, even every little sector of Tokyo has its own Matsuri. And uh, the Matsuri, or maybe more than one of them in the year, is a huge occasion of celebration and, and worth uh, getting involved in if, if you're in a region that's having a matsuri at the time. I do remember one time I was traveling through Tokyo and I happened to stumble across a small local matsuri that I had no idea about. And that's that's what happens. This happens in Japan, that you stumble across things. The unexpected is often the, the best in Japan. I think we have come to the very end of our time together, Philip. I'm happy to give a final little message if you'd like me to do that as well. Absolutely, uh, if you have anything okay. you'd like to share. What I'd say is uh, come and join the Australia Japan Society. As I say, individual membership, it's quite a reasonable price. All you have to do really is type AJSNSW into your browser and you'll be able to find a lot more information. We're um, waiting to, to welcome you and uh, to, to make you part of this excellent organisation. Well, that's a very strong final message for everybody who's listening. Well, so <laughs> thank you so much, Philip. Thank you, Jess. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Pleasure to talk to you as well. And um, I'll catch you at the next AJSU South Wales event. Look forward to that.